Looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another recreational programming session with Mr. Zozin. <clears throat> Let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream, Red Circle, live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch at dot at television website? Today, let me open my notes. Uh, we are doing Tula programming language. Yes, we continue uh, developing the thing that we did yesterday. I have no idea what happened. I was just trying to put a space like Discord. Are you okay? Uh, right, so I'm gonna give the link to where we're doing all of that. HTTPS uh, twitch.tv uh, It's so freaking slow. It's insane slash toting and I'm gonna ping everyone who's interested in being pinged and there we go The stream has officially started. The stream has officially started. Hello. Hello everyone. Welcome. 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 So uh, a Tula programming language, right, so essentially Tula stands for Turing language, right, it's based on a Turing machine, uh, right, and a Turing machine, if you never heard about Turing machine, I re really recommend you to google it up, Turing machine, uh, right, we already looked into what it is on previous streams, and there's a lot of actual information about what is a Turing machine online, especially on YouTube, computer file and stuff like that, right, so you can check out those. Uh, right, so in the main sort of like a program um, of a Turing machine is a table, right, so which consists of five elements, right, so your current state, whatever you're reading on the on the head of the Turing machine, or, 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 right, on the head of the Turing machine, right, because it consists of the infinite tape and the head that reads and writes into, into the tape, so the second element here is what you read from the tape. And then uh, the third element is what you have to write into the current cell if you are in this state and you read this symbol, right? The next thing is where you have to move the head afterwards, uh, right or left. And the, uh, the next thing is what state you have to switch to, right? So that's basically a single row of the Turing machine table. And a program for a Turing machine consists of sequence of such rows. Right. So here we have a very simple um, program for a Turing machine that increments a binary, binary number. So we can take a look at the uh, examples of the binary numbers. Right. So this is how they look like. They consist of bits, zeros and ones. And in here we choose the format of a least significant bit. So the least significant bit is located at the beginning and it grows towards the right. Right. So that way it is easier for the Turing machine to sort of process this kind of thing. Uh, right, and essentially this particular program increments such binary number by one, right? So uh, essentially if you are in increment state and you see zero, it's actually pretty straightforward and pretty easy to increment such number. You just replace it with one and you halt. Uh, since we never actually defined anything for the state halt, it's a halting state. If you encounter one, if you encounter one, you basically replace it with zero, you move to the right and you continue replacing ones with zeros until you e encounter zero and then you change it to one and that's how you increment the number. We can actually take a look at this entire thing. So uh, the entire language, the entire interpreter, this is rather interpreter rather than compiler though i have a couple of ideas on actually making this language compilable to the actual x86 64 machine code right so i'm not really sure if i'll be able to pull that off but i have a couple of ideas on that uh right so the entire language is written in rust so here it is the uh, the interpreter and stuff like that so let's actually rebuild it just in case uh rust c tula rs there we go. And uh, what you have to do when you run this interpreter, you have to provide the program, right? And then the tape, the, the data for the Turing machine. Uh, right, so let's provide the increment Tula and let's provide the thing even bits. And as you can see here, it is going to basically trace the state of the Turing machine, right? So this is the initial state of the tape. And to increment such number, we just replace it with like the first zero with one and we halt. Nothing particularly special, nothing particularly interesting. So here, if we uh, take a look at the odd bits, right? So this one is going to be a little bit more interesting, actually. So let's feed odd bits into this entire thing. And as you can see, the process became a little bit more involved, uh, right? It was basically going through all of the ones until it encountered the first zero. And then it replaced that first zero with one. And there you go. It declared it to be incremented. Uh, very simple, very, very straightforward. What's interesting is that you can also define a decrement program which does a similar thing, but it's sort of like inverted, right? So it does an opposite thing. You can even compare them. Look at them, right? You can actually see that incrementing and decrementing a binary number is basically the same operation. It's just like symmetrical, uh, right? So this is what I like about this it's kind of like Turing machine and stuff like that. You can, uh, you can find beautiful things like that. 
Uh, right, so it's just like increment and decremented is basically the same operation, it's just like the symbols are swapped. Um, right. So, and with this kind of language, you can write more complex applications. Uh, for example, checking whether parentheses are balanced. Right, so here's the program that does that. So it's a pretty involved program, right? So, and uh, the notion of Turing Tarpit exists for a reason, right? So <laughs> it's a pretty involved program, but uh, the input for such a program, let's actually take a look. So we have a parent state and uh, there you go. So here, um, so actually our tokenizer, I recently wrote a Lexa, a proper Lexa for this machine uh, off screen, right? So our Lexa actually separates parentheses uh, like by one character, right? So you don't have to put spaces between them. And I did that intentionally and you see uh, like why I did that a little bit later. Right, so I use ampersand as sort of like a delimiter between the actual input, the actual string with parentheses and the counter in here. And the counter in here so that's basically the input we start executing it here and basically what this program does at the end it will tell us whether the parentheses are balanced or not so as you can see here they are unbalanced let's actually make them balanced uh right so i'm gonna just take the balanced uh program and i'm gonna feed it parents uh all right like so and after doing all of the different manipulations like that it ends up in a state called balance telling that that the parentheses were balanced right so it can uh, qu uh, quite reliably identify balanced parentheses if we try to make them unbalanced it will also identify that too right it's going to end uh, at unbalanced state Right, so if you want to know how exactly we came up with this program, right, and as you can see, it is a pretty complicated program, uh, watch a previous stream, right, so it's actually kind of cool, I, I really like how I came up with this entire thing, uh, right, but that's basically the language, but that's basically the language. The problem with this language is that uh, you have to, like, define a lot of like each individual situation you have to consider each individual situation and that leads to like a straight up combinatorial explosion um right and you can already kind of feel a combinatorial explosion in here for example there's a very good example here right so in this state in the state deck one we're basically skipping all of the parentheses until we encounter an ampersand a delimiter right and what if we need to skip more things Right, if we add to our vocabulary another symbol, I have to go through all of the places where I have situations like that and update, add additional thing in here, right? For example, I added, uh, you know, square brackets, right? And it's like rather inconvenient. So this particular, in this particular state, this Turing machine is actually very difficult to program in. Um, it is extremely difficult to program in. And one of the things I want you to do for this Turing machine is to actually implement some sort of a meta language on top of it, which allows you to generate rules based on abstract notions and stuff like that. So this is kind of like a, uh, the final look and feel, the final vibe, the final coziness of the language. People like to use word cozy to describe languages. I still have no idea what the fuck they mean by that. Right, so... Yeah, this is basically... Does it look cozy? Hmm? Do we have any Zoomers in the chat? Could you tell me, is that a cozy language? Because I have no idea what that means. Is that a cozy enough? Y yes, it is cozy. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Cozy was... <laughs> um, all right. So, um, we can try to implement something more complex, right? So, specifically, we can try to implement um whatever i tried to implement in here and this is a very interesting program it's a very concise program uh precisely because we have all of these features that allows us to meta generate things and by the way that language does not exist at all right so i just made it up i just shed it out out of my brain uh it straight up doesn't exist i confabulated it like chat gpt so um if we can try to implement whatever we have in here which is rule 110 how would it even look like um, so this is very, 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 very interesting, right? So rule 110 by itself is a Turing complete thing, right? So then we have a Turing machine, so that means it should be possible to implement rule 110 in Turing machine. It should be possible. <sighs> How do you link this language with ready? <laughs> I will think about that, actually. I, I was kind of thinking about maybe implementing 
um, visualization of the state of the machine in Rayleap, not really calling Rayleap from the language, but embedding Rayleap into the interpreter so it shows the like what's going on inside of the Turing machine, uh, right? So maybe slap some shaders into that, and maybe that will make a banger video, right? So because people like visualizations and stuff like that, you know, three blue, one brown style, uh, right? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll see, we'll see. So first we need to implement the language, right? So we have to have something uh, that looks like the language that I want. And then we can think about like nice things, uh, nice visualizations and stuff like that. Uh, let's try to implement rule 110. How about that? Right, so um, we need some sort of a tape. All right, so rule 110 tape. So what's going to be the input? So I suppose the input is going to consist from uh, bits, right? Bits. This ones. Uh, these are bits, as you can as you can hear. It's, it's too many bits. I actually, let's actually make it a little bit shorter. Uh, so, and it would be kind of nice to denote the begin and end. What I like to do, I like to use the ampersand as sort of the delimiter, right? So there's no particular meaning uh, behind the ampersand. It's just like it's a delimiter, right? Some sort of a delimiter that is different from the main sort of characters that we use, bits and parentheses. Uh, I'm really sorry. Yeah, beatbox. Yeah, beatbox, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> so, and uh, how would we even implement that? So let's actually start with maybe creating the rule uh, 110 uh, Tula. Um, so, we usually start from here, right? So we always kind of start from here. Uh, so that means we need some sort of entry, right? So, and we know that at the beginning of the entry, we have a delimiter. So uh, we're gonna just leave it as it is. We're gonna go to the right and we're gonna go to another state. I don't really know how to call it. I'm gonna call it just I, uh, right? So, and in this I, we have to do something. So if you don't know how rule 110 works, so let's actually Google that rule 110. Uh, so by the way, I, th I think I need to acknowledge the subs. Uh, let me quickly acknowledge the subs because people are subscribing, giving me money and stuff like that. So thank you so much to Cube a lot with the tier one subscription with the method show third year. Let's go. Also one of in web stack. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I've done web development before, so was it not enough? So something like Zozilip uh, is essentially part of my web stack that I actually kind of plan to use one day. Uh, yeah, Zozilip, not Zozilip. Maybe I should call it Zozilip. It actually sounds cute. Uh, right, so this kind of thing. Um, right, so it's basically like an implementation of subset of Raylip in JavaScript. <laughs> Sounds dumb, but it, it's actually what it is. So this is my web stack. Uh, if you were ever interested in this kind of stuff, so I was actually thinking to port Epers to this library, but uh, compiling Ada to WebAssembly is actually such an ass that I'm not sure if I'll be able to pull that off. But we'll see, we'll see. Uh, right, so I won't promise anything. So um, yeah. Uh, and uh, Shalil, thank you so much for your answer question uh, with a question, what the fuck is Tula? I've been told yesterday that Tula in some of the dialects of Spanish, it means dick. So, and I'm going with that. So that's what it means. <laughs> right. Wait, this is already a second language that is called after dick. What the fuck is wrong with me? Like my previous language was also called, literally called dick, but in Russian. And now this is a dick, but in Spanish. I'm Spanish, can confirm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck is wrong with I keep thinking about dicks. Uh, Tula is a city in Russia. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> but I kind of like the theory that I called it after the, the Spanish word. I kind of like it better. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so I was thinking maybe make, it, make a logo uh, for, for this language as a samovar where where the the thing looks like whatever uh, doesn't matter <laughs> jail frustum a thank you so much uh for twitch pound question thank you thank you thank you uh 10 percent delta thank you so much for tier one with the message 10 streak woo 10 streak woo indeed um all right so let's take a look at uh, rule 110 <clears throat> 
so yeah essentially the idea of rule 110 is that you have a window of three bits so it's a one-dimensional um, um cellular automaton right so it's a one-dimensional one so something like a conway's game of life is two-dimensional one this one is two, uh, one dimensional uh right and essentially you slide the window right you slide the window and you compute sort of like the next state of this entire thing uh right and depending on what pattern you see in that window you have to actually replace it with a different bit the question is the question is how the fuck you do that in a turing machine right so like given the description of the turing machine uh, given the description of the turing machine that where you can only have the um basically a table of states with what's the current state what you read on the tape what you have to write there where you have to move and where you have to switch how the fuck do you implement uh rule 110 that sounds like a very daunting task unless you know a trick unless you know a trick that is usually not described literally anywhere and i discovered that trick actually myself accidentally while i was playing with turing machines uh, on a piece of paper so so you you may think that states are just arbitrary things but you can store information in these states and it's like, like, how we do that? What does it even fucking mean? Like, what? You can store information. State itself actually carries, uh, carries information. State itself carries information. So, and without a special, like, a meta language, it's kind of difficult to describe. But I'm going to try to do that. So, essentially, when we go into the I state and we encounter, for instance, zero, right we encounter zero and uh we're gonna write it zero we're gonna go to the right and we're gonna switch to a different state so we f first thing we have to do um first thing we have to do we have to collect uh, the window of three bits right so since the window is three bits we need to accumulate it first before we're gonna create a rolling window right so it has to be rolling window so we need to accumulate the bits how are we going to be accumulating them okay so the first state is i we encountered zero and let's imagine let's imagine that we take that zero and we attach it to the state i so we switch into the state called i zero there is nothing particularly special about that zero in the name of that state there is nothing particularly special it's just a part of the name but we decided to call it like that yeah exactly exactly it becomes state zeros exactly 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 so for some reason nobody really explains you this kind of shit right usually when you google up turing machines and how they work they just give you like a robot definition of a turing machine turing machine is a machine with a tape with the cells and the head that moves left and right you know the, the, the wikipedia style shit like nobody fucking explains you this kind of stuff um uh, but it's insane that you can store like literally information in the state and it, this is so fucking cool right and when you encounter like one right you also go here uh right and uh you switch to the state i1 right so essentially we collected the first bit right so we sort of collected the first bit um, okay uh, then uh, we need to go to the state i0 right and in a state i0 we encounter zero we're gonna leave it as it is we go to the right and guess which state we're gonna switch to we're gonna switch to the state i0 zero, zero right if in the state i0 we encounter one we're gonna leave it as it is but we're gonna switch to the state i0 one and you have to repeat that shit for all of these things for one one uh right you have to do it like that uh right and now you have to define <laughs> right if you are in this state you encounter zero right so you encounter zero you go to the right you go into zero 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 uh right and you see the combinatorial explosion right so it is pretty cool that you can store information that you can store information in the state but it creates a very nasty combinatorial explosion that is very difficult to manage it is extremely difficult to manage 
Uh, so when I was encountering that, when I was encountering that, like it would be, I, I, the first thing I thought, it would be kind of nice to have some sort of a preprocessor that just allows us to generate this kind of thing. So obviously what we have in here, uh, we have um, a set of bits, right? So we have some sort of a set of bits. So it would be nice in our language to have uh, a syntax that allows me to define bits, which is basically this thing. So there you go, I've got a set of bits. And then uh, it would be kind of nice if I could say, like instead of these two rules, I would say, okay, so for A, maybe let's call it B because it's bits. For B in bits, right, for B in bits, uh, yield a rule b b i b right and this this will literally expand this will literally expand into two rules zero 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 one 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 right so that would be kind of cool uh so then um essentially uh now you you need to basically get them uh like uh, this sort of pair. Uh, you can actually do nested loops, right? You can actually do nested loops. So this is going to be the first one. Let's actually switch to A, right? So we're going to have like an A, uh, B, and C, right? So this is going to be something like that. So this is going to be A, and then another nested thing here is going to be B. Uh, and in here, uh, essentially, if I am in a state I, A, right, and then encounter B, I just leave it as it is, I move it to the right, but I'm switching to the state A, uh, like I, A, B. And that will generate actually these four rules, because it's a nested loop. Right. So I was also thinking that maybe it will, like for a single sort of statements, it would make sense to maybe get rid of these uh, curly braces. So you can actually maybe write this kind of stuff like this, uh, right? And maybe it would make sense to switch the highlighting to JavaScript, right? Because JavaScript has for and ins and stuff like that, uh, right? So now we're kind of getting closer to what I initially showed. Uh, I kind of, we're kind of getting closer to what I initially showed. Uh, right. And then we can go for, uh, for the three bits in here, right? So for example, if uh, for A in bits and for B in bits and for C in bits, uh, right. So if I am in a state I, A, B, and I encounter C, I leave it as it is. But here is an interesting thing, All right? So here is an interesting thing. So essentially, I collected the three bits in here, but I have to replace the bit that is in the center in here. So that means after collecting the third bit, I have to go to the left. And only now, I have to actually um, basically look up the table. So in here, um, I think I'm going to create a special state called something like uh, rule one uh, one one zero. Oh, essentially, I'm going to call it R, and I'm going to put all of these three bits in there, and I'm going to go to the left. Right, I'm going to go to the left. Uh, right. So because I will need to have like a lot of nested fours, I was thinking that maybe nested fours could be described like this. Okay, for a for a in bits and for b in bits could be contract. Uh, you know, shortened like this. So and this is basically two uh, nested for loops for A and for B, right, something like this, for A and for B, uh, right, so, and also maybe for A, B, and C, uh, I can also do something like this, uh, right, uh, yep, and what's interesting is that now, uh, things like A, B, and C, they feel like variables, and the sets that they are iterating feel like types, right, by defining this sort of sets of symbols, we actually defining a type. So this becomes sort of like a type Turing machine. And here we say, okay, so for a thing that is of that type, do this kind of rule. Right, isn't it cool? And by the way, type, um, uh, type is actually a set, right? If you think about it, type defines some sort of like a set. Uh, of all of the possible values of that type. Uh, so syntactically, this doesn't really look nice because there is no separation between for and 
the body of that for and because of that i was thinking that i'm gonna actually introduce something like a case in here so every case every rule has to start with case so now this kind of becomes readable uh if you know what i mean right so that kind of becomes readable and once we so this entire thing is basically defines a bunch of rules to collect uh, these three bits into rule right and now we can just go ahead and hard code the table of these rules right so we can have r uh, zero 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 uh, right so this is going to be that and this is going to be that that uh, that 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 and that right so and in this state honestly in this state uh, it doesn't really matter what we have in here. We're going to replace it based on these three elements. So because of that, we can just ignore that. Um, we can basically come up with something like this. So let's say underscore. And we can say that underscore is one of the bits in here. Right. So something like this. Uh, right. So something like this. And... Uh, then what we have to do we have to just replace it according to the table i actually remember for a fact uh right so that these first three has to be ones and these two have to be ones so it's actually very easy to remember this three is one zero, zero um yeah so this is another one and this one like this so since we're currently in here right since we can do here after we replace the uh, the bit we have to move to the right uh right let's actually do it like that and now what state we have to switch to uh we have to switch to back to the state i but without the third bit so we can accumulate the third bit so we can emulate the sort of like a rolling window uh, and essentially we just like put a last bit in here so that state can now uh, in here uh, go and accumulate sort of like the third uh, the third bit actually this one right and we, we keep doing that until we encounter this delimiter and once we encounter this delimiter we have to go back and so on and so forth so this is basically the justification for these four loops for this sort of for loops uh, but i mean this is not particularly convenient because the like a and b they feel like part of the name so what i was thinking is that um basically allow the interpreter to use not only just symbols not only just symbols but actually something like s expressions right? let's just say that a symbol is not only an atom a name or but also as s expression that will allow you sort of like attach uh, more information to these symbols like so uh right and it's basically equivalent to whatever i just wrote anyway right uh, so something like this so now we have like s expressions and stuff like that um i could have just like used maybe uh, you know the functors or something like this but i mean eh, it doesn't really matter um right so and now it starts to look basically like the concept that i yeah it, it's basically that it, it is actually literally that so i forgot to actually replace s expressions in the in the table of bits in here but you get the point uh right so you get the point i can actually do that in bulk uh like so right let's put the spaces in here uh right so something yeah there we go jesus christ <laughs> right and we also have to put the case in here uh right so this is not a full implementation obviously right so because we probably need to uh maybe take a look at the situation uh when i have two bits but instead of the next bit i encounter and encountering the uh the delimiter here at the end right so essentially i just processed like the last thing uh, I then went here, right? So we collected that uh, and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I suppose this is not super correct, but it doesn't really matter to be, to be fair, right? So w whatever we have to do now, we have to actually implement, uh, you know, four loops for this entire thing. Uh, four loops for this entire thing. Sounds interesting, right? So that's basically the language that I want to have. Not the language that I have right now, but I want to have, right? So this is like the end goal. Uh, I was also thinking to um, to have maybe if conditions in here, right? So for the situations when I'm basically like doing nested loop, 
uh, for two sets in here. Right, and maybe I want to, for whatever reason, exclude um, the beats in here that are equal to each other, right? So I can say that A and B should not be equal to each other, right? And then this sort of like, um, the rules that you put in here, they will make sure that A and B are not the same things. Um, so I think I had a situation when I needed that, but I forgot the exact example. Uh, I really forgot the exact example. And of course, you, you should be able to do this kind of thing and maybe shorten it up uh, like so. Um, yeah, this, is, this actually looks cool. Like for A and B in bits, right? So, and that basically performs a Cartesian product on these two sets. And then for, for this, when they are not equal to each other, the case is when I, uh, right? So I, A and B and so on and so forth, um, right? So Python least comprehension energy. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's inspired by, you know, by math, essentially. So whatever you have in like least comprehension in Python is basically the syntax for defining set sets from set theory, right? So actually this kind of syntax was invented before, not only before Python, but before computers existed, right? <laughs> so the idea of least comprehension existed before computers. Just, just think about it. Mathematicians were already playing with that idea for quite some time, uh, right? <laughs> so yeah. Mm -mm. Haskell is comprehension too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. My friend. So and that actually like plays really, really nicely, right? So we basically bring in set theory into Turing machine. And that basically makes it a type Turing machine to some extent, extent, right? So you you may say that it's a, like a type Turing machine, right? So because now we basically have types in here. Um, maybe I don't really know. Mm -mm, sorry. And I really want to have like an extra uh, keyword case in here because it, it really helps to separate the for loops uh, and the body of the for loops, right? Because without this case, it's kind of like really difficult to read. So it doesn't really have to be the case. It just has to be something to do that separation, right? Especially when you don't have the curly braces and stuff like that. Um, you need to have this kind of separation. Um, and yeah. It could be anything, so but a case is useful because uh, we have a highlighting for JavaScript in here, right? So it's just like easy to enable JavaScript highlighting. There you go, you already have this thing, so I don't have to write my own highlighting mode for, for this thing. <clears throat> mm. Weak philosophers wrote to machines on paper too. Interesting. Um, to be fair, it's just a formalization of the algorithm. Uh, you can say that people wrote algorithms before Turing machine, right? Before computers and stuff like that. So uh, algorithm is not really a new idea, right? It's just it, for the longest time it was an informal idea, right? So whatever the Turing machine does, it formalizes the notion of the algorithm. Um, mm -mm. It just formalizes the notion of the algorithm. And since we established this like very interesting syntax, can we just go back uh, to the balance parentheses shit and make it more readable? Right. So let's actually take a look. So here is the balanced, right? Can we make this shit more readable? Because this is freaking unreadable. Um, right. So that would have been nice, I think. That would have been nice. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Seprasi, for a tier one submission with the message 10th month um, contribution to the struggling Jeff Bezos. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, algebra al algorithm. In fact, they come from the same words, from the name of the Persian mathematician, uh, Al Charisma, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm, I forgot his full name. Um, so he wrote a, a textbook for algebra and for whatever reason, we also started to call the sequence of actions after his name, right? I don't really know how it came to be, but um, yeah, al Karizmi. Muhammad ibn Musa al Karizmi. yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 it's him. <clears throat> Very cool Persian mathematician. Mm -mm. 
Oh, he produces a sequence of actions to solve the quadratic equation. An algorithm. Okay, okay. So he was writing algorithms, basically. So, okay, that makes sense. There's also a kind of a funny thing uh, in Russian language regarding algorithms. Uh, right. So essentially, um, Markov, which is not the Russian Empire mathematician, but it's his son, which is a Soviet mathematician. Um, when there was a craze around computational models, when like during machine lambda calculus, when people finally discovered like that, uh, you, you know, um, the holding problem is unresolvable. Everyone was talking about like Turing machines and lambda calculus. In Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet mathematician Markov also came up with his uh, computation model, which is called uh, Markov's algorithms. Andre, I, I think they're both Andre. I, I think they're both Andre, but but I don't quite remember. Uh, right. So they called algorithms Markov algorithms, and they're actually very interesting. So essentially, they are tables. So you, they operate on the string of symbols, and the program uh, and the program is basically a pattern, and what you have to replace that pattern with. So basically, pattern of the sequence of symbols, and replace that pattern with another sequence of symbols. And what you're supposed to do, you have to iterate this string from left to right and see that does that pattern fit okay replace it with that one and that is actually Turing complete system right so uh he was playing with that so but at the time the word algorithm the word algorithm was actually quite new so there was no established pronunciation in russian in russian language how to pronounce the word algorithm whether you have to pronounce it as algorithm or algorithm we just didn't know. Do we, we pronounce it like in English, algorithm, or do we put T in there because of transliteration rules and stuff like that? We, we don't really know. And so Markov actually called them algorithm, right? But everywhere else called them algorithm. And it's so fucking weird. Like you're reading that and it's just like, it feels like, uh, like why is it written like that? And, like, and, and they preserved their, like, their original spelling, which is kind of incorrect in the modern Russian, in his old writings and old books, and you open it up and you read it, why is it fucking spelled like that, right? So holy shit. And it's spelled like that because at the time, the pronunciation in Russian language was not established, but nobody cared to fucking fix that, right? So it's just so fucking funny. <laughs> Uh, right. And to this day, it is a convention when you talk about al mark of algorithms to call them algorithm, but everywhere else you have to call them algorithm. So it's just like, eh? Okay. <laughs> um, um, interesting. Yeah, it's kind of bizarre. <clears throat> but to be fair, it's not really that popular a computation model, so um, nobody really studies it that much. So. <clears throat> but it's kind of interesting. I heard that you can kind of simulate this kind of model with just a um, sequence with regular expressions, uh, right? So, yeah, but basically you can have a table of regular expressions and you can demonstrate that the table of regular expression is basically Turing complete. And you can basically write like Turing complete programs with that. Uh, so sort of mimicking the mark of algorithm, algorithms. Um, <clears throat> In Spanish, algorithm mean dick. Um, I'm not surprised, honestly. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay, very funny. Uh, very, very funny. Anyways, uh, so what we're going to do, I suppose what we first want to start with is parsing sets. Right, so let's uh, try to parse the sets. Uh, right, how we're going to be distinguishing whether we're trying to parse the set or the rule? I suppose by the first keyword. Um, where is the... Yeah, there we go. So suppose the way we parse the statement, we just look into the first word that we see. And if the word is the case, we're trying to parse the case. If the word let, we're trying to parse the bits or the, the set, right? If the word for, we're trying to parse the for loops and so on and so forth. Um, also, it would be nice to maybe introduce the blocks, right? So if it starts with curly brace, uh, like combine that into a block, right? So, and a block is basically like for loop repeats that block several times or something like that. Um, right. Tooling complete language today. Yeah, very funny. 
<clears throat> All the regular expressions in language are not regular uh, languages in the chunk in, uh, Chomsky said. No, I'm not meaning like the actual regular expression that is like, you know, during complete or anything like that. Like you have a table of regular expressions, like one regular expression and what you have to substitute it to. And then you have several of them and you have a piece of code that iterates over them and checks them and replaces them. So the, the regular expression themselves are not Turing complete, but the additional code that you put on top of that table makes it Turing complete, right? So that's what I was talking about, um, right? Mm, anyways, 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 anyways. Uh, so parse case, here's the function that parses the case, uh, but we probably need to have uh, something uh, that parses um, some other things. Mm -mm. So parse cases, uh, essentially when we parse the case, what we want to do, uh, so uh, as you can see, I already recently implemented Alexa and Alexa has a peak symbol and uh, also next symbol. So, but in our case, I suppose what we want to do, we want to do next symbol, right? So, and let's take a look at what kind of symbol do we have? Well, we, we call it key, right? So this is going to be a keyword. Uh, this is a keyword. We're going to take the keyword and match its name. By the way, uh, symbols now uh, have an allocation associated with them, right? So off screen, I implemented a proper uh, a proper parse, a, parse, a proper lexa. So now if you look into the symbol, there is a location and location. Uh, if we take a look at what it is, it's a struct. Yeah, it, it has a file path, row and column, so you can actually do a proper reporting of the uh, of the tokens and stuff like that. So it's rather convenient. Uh, right, so where is my parse cases? Right, so here is the parse cases. So if we encounter uh, name, right, so here we can check if this thing is a case, right, if this thing is a case, we have to parse the case and push it into the cases, right? So, yeah, that's pretty straightforward, I would even say. Right, that's pretty straightforward. If we encounter something like let, um, I suppose we want to introduce a thing called sets, right? So let's do sets, which is going to be a vector, uh, right? And so on and so forth. But here is an interesting thing. Um, sets have names. Uh, sets have names and I suppose it doesn't make sense to allow the user to define the same set several times, right? So the names for the sets should be unique. Because of that, I think it has to be a hash table, uh, honestly, right? So it has to be a hash map uh, like this and the hash map is going to map uh, the um, name, a certain name to a sequence of symbols, right? So let's maybe just call it um how how i'm gonna put that a vector symbol uh right so vector symbol uh nsa and the same is just like like a lifetime right so right because we have we have a reference inside of that structure um right so it's gonna be just a sequence of those things and uh, we'll see how it goes right so maybe it's gonna work maybe it's not gonna work um right in case of the let uh so let me see what we can have in here uh, so we then have to get the um, the symbol, right? So let's parse the name. Um, let name. So we provide the lexa in here, and we've got the name. And we need to check whether we already have that name, right? Do we already have that name? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't remember how to do that. So let's do Rust up doc path, uh, right? So show me the path. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to go to the documentation. Uh, documentation. Uh, so we get some sub. Thank you so much, Yak and Shears. <laughs> That's a cool name. <laughs> Thank you so much for Twitch Prime. I really like it. Uh, so there we go. So where is the API? Oh, I'm sorry if it was too loud. Uh, mm -mm. Classic. Yeah, I love Rust, but, but you, you, by the way, before you criticize Rust, you obligate you to say, I love Rust, but, and there you go. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, okay, so let me see what we have in here. So is there something like exists or contains or something like that? Yeah, contains the key. So there's literally contains the key. 
Uh, yeah. Mm, and by the way, it would be kind of nice to actually also tell you uh, where that thing is defined, if you know what I'm talking about, like where that thing is defined. Maybe because of that, it would be nice to maybe use a symbol as a key. All right. So, but that means I have to define a custom hashing and custom comparison for this entire stuff. So I'm haven't decided yet, right? So because essentially, if I just go to the symbol, if I just go to the symbols uh, and just slap, uh, you know, partial equal and hash, it will apply to lock and um, like equal and hash to lock, which is not correct, right? So because you can have uh, same symbols located in different locations. So that means I'll have to have a custom partial equal and custom hash, which only applied to name. And I'm not really sure how to think about that. So because of that, I'm maybe not going to be reporting uh, where this thing is already defined, but maybe in the future, I will do that, right? Maybe in the future, I will do that. So anyway, so we're going to have sets contains key, uh, and this is going to be name, name. Um, all right. And if it's already contains, we need to do something like this, e print ln. Um, right. So, and essentially we're going to put a location in here. We're going to say error, uh, set, uh, name is already defin defined. Uh, we can say something like redefinition of set name because it's a more established sort of like a vocabulary. So location is basically the location of the name in here, right? So we might as well actually do a pretty cool thing. We can say, this is the symbol name location right so and that allows us to do name uh, and that automatically picks uh, picks up this kind of stuff so and after that we can just return error and there we go so we checked that we're not redefining the uh the thing in here so okay uh then the next thing we have to do uh we actually uh put equals in here i'm not really sure if equals is that important right so i'm not trying to put uh, too much syntactical noise in here. So if something is not particularly needed, I think I don't want to put it in here. So let's actually not put equals in here and only leave the uh, curly braces, right? So let's only leave curly braces in here. So that's going to be the definition, but that could be changed in the future, right? So because when you define in a case, you don't put any delimiter or any equals between the symbols of the state. So it's very much like not syntactically noisy, right? So I try not to put too much syntactical noise into the language because there is you already can uh, use pretty much any character as a symbol which may create a lot of accidental syntactical noise so let's not just force you to put equals in here right it doesn't really make sense in my opinion uh, anyways but again all of that can be changed doesn't matter um, so and I suppose we need to have uh, a separate function that parses the set let's do parse set uh, all right so it's gonna be Alexa and that parse set is going to return a vector of symbols, essentially, right? It is going to return a vector of symbols. And uh, yeah, so let me maybe call it a set. So in once we parsed everything in here, we can finally get the set and we can insert uh, name set and there we go. So this entire function essentially uh, parses the top level statements, right? So as you can see, it doesn't parse the cases, it just parses top level statements. Uh, and case is just one of the top level statements. So that means we need to return both the vector of cases and the sets. So uh, because of that, maybe we need to define some sort of a new structure that actually keeps both cases, right? So this is gonna be the cases that we have in here uh like so so this is going to be the cases and the sets right so this is going to be the sets uh like so but the question is how do we call this uh, uh the structure so i suppose it's some sort of a it's a program right so uh we already have like a tape right file and tool of file which is the program itself so I, I don't know, Let, let's just call it program, right? So this is gonna be the program and let's parse program, right? And we're gonna return program in here as well. And in fact, we can, instead of defining these things in here, we can just define a program, right? So, and we can make 
uh, program defaultable, right? So it will automatically initialize these things with default values. So we're gonna do right default. Uh, and we don't need this kind of stuff in here. So we're basically putting that into the structure directly. And after that, we just return the problem. So let's go through the compilation errors, right? So that's basically the direction I wanna move to. Um, right, so let's see how it's gonna go. Um, so did it, did it actually compile? It didn't really compile the program. Rust C, Tula, RS, and let's go to the compilation errors. Okay, so um, yeah, classic. We need to have an NSA life sign. Uh, what else do we have in here? So program requires an NSA lifetime. Sure. Uh, what else do we have in here? So hash map. We don't have hash maps. I suppose we just have to do std uh, collections hash map. There we go. So what else do we have in here? Uh, case is push because we have to prefix the program. Uh, right program. What else do we have? Program. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. So let's recompile it one more time. So next symbol, next symbol uh, results. And this function returns results. So yeah, I know, but I'm also returning the result. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, so, ah, fuck. N next symbol returns an option. Fuck me. All right, so that's, um, oh yeah, so what we essentially have to do, we have to parse a symbol, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a special function that basically wraps around the this thing. So parse symbol, we provide this kind of thing, so now we can actually adapt it properly. Uh, okay, and that seems to be working more or less. Type annotation needs, really? Bruv, I'm, oh, it, it, it wants mutable, right? So you, you just want mutable, my friend. D don't freaking tell me. Don't freaking tell me that it's not enough. Like, okay, I'm returning a program in here and I'm explicitly saying that the program is whatever I return at the end in here. So your type inference is not enough to figure it out? Are you for real? A program default, we can do that, sure. But I mean, so, okay, you have enough information. Okay, like I'm not gonna do that, but I'm just saying that you have enough information to figure it out. Uh, and I'm talking to the compiler, by the way. Like, why don't you just do that? Is it just like an unsolved problem? I'm pretty sure Haskell can do that. Uh, but I mean, I don't know. whatever. Uh, so parse set, and we don't have that function yet. So we need to implement it first. So where's the parse case? fn parse um, set, right? So here we uh, have NSA, uh, we'll provide the lexa. So mute lexa, also NSA, uh, result. Uh, it's actually not read, but result. And what do we have in here? So we're gonna have like, um, so we actually parse sets, right? So this is gonna be vector of symbols. Uh, of NSA, of course, obviously. It's a vector of symbols of NSA. And for now, we can just say that it's not implemented, right? I want this thing to just compile. Uh, right, so parse set. Yeah, it's a single set. I don't know why I decided to call it sets, because it's single set is a sequence anyway. Uh, parse cases, okay, so here we're parsing a program, and this thing becomes a program. Uh, right, so and this is the first state and stuff like that, uh, and program cases, program case. Okay, so what else do we have in here? So, yeah, program. Uh, interestingly, I think in the future when we compute the next sort of state for the machine, we're going to be providing the entirety of the program because, uh, like, if one of the cases is actually for loop, right, we'll need to have an access to the sets so we can expand everything appropriately. Right, so, and the question is, how do you even interpret this thing? Right, so it's, it's kind of cool that we came up with this thing, but how do we interpret that? Right, so there's one approach, which is a very dumb approach, literally implement the preprocessor and generate each individual rule in a combinatorial explosion fashion. We can do that, and that will kind of work. But I have a kind of a different idea and essentially treat it as an interpreter. So as of right now, how do we compute the next state? How we match the cases, right? So if I take a look at the increment, right? So uh, it's pretty straightforward. So I for, look at the first case and I see, does it match? Does it match? And if it matches, I apply that and then I repeat the process and so on and so forth. And then I go to, to all the cases. We can do the same thing 
with this thing we can basically parse an ast of all of these expressions and we can treat for instance this entire thing like this big entire thing as a single case and then we can basically ask this case is the current state of the turing machine matches this case and how matching would look like right so essentially the matching will look like uh basically trying to interpret that so we essentially going to be treating these things as variables of type bits and then we can can look into the state of the virtual machine and pattern match the state of the virtual machine with these variables with these types and that will kind of achieve the same effect if you know what i'm talking about right so as i implement it you, you will see what i mean right so but i think it's it's a right way to go because again because of the combinatorial explosion like um, you will generate a lot of rules and it will slow down the entire thing significantly. I think it would be better to just literally interpret this entire thing, but interpret it in a way that acts like we expanded all these rules. Uh, right. So yeah, that's basically my idea, essentially, for, for this entire stuff. We'll see how it goes. So um, all of the details on, like how all of that works and stuff like that are definitely going to be in the final video right so because all of that goes towards a youtube video it's going to be super cool youtube video i hope uh right so where i demonstrate a lot of cool things uh in this language and also some insights that i've got about Turing machines and stuff like that when i was playing with them right so i, I think the most powerful idea again of the Turing machine is that the state is also a place where you can store information you can store information not only in the tape, right? So uh, people, when the people hear the description of the Turing machine, they think, oh, that's the only place where you store information. No, 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 no. There is a second place where you store information, and that's the state itself, right? It's a limited storage. It's a temporary storage, but it's a storage nonetheless. And that's a very powerful idea, which kind of unlocks a lot of things within the Turing machine, uh, right? And it's very often overlooked. It is very often overlooked. With this language, I'm kind of making the state of the Turing machine as a storage explicit. CPU register, you got it. Yeah, yeah. I was almost, yeah, I was about to get there. This is the equivalent of CPU registers. Yes, this this temporary storage, like in the states, is basically CPU registers. And you can get that idea even further. You can get that idea even further. Speaking of generating an efficient assembly out of that thing, if the state where you store information is basically the registers who said i can't store these things in literally registers racks rbx rcx and so on and so forth and we're already talking about exact specific machine which is x8664 and what's interesting is that uh, x8664 is not a like it has a random access memory right it doesn't have a sequential access memory because of that because of that, instead of lefts and rights, we can basically have a, a variant of Tula where you have to provide an exact address where to jump to. So you have an infinite memory, like logically infinite, right? So logically infinite memory. And uh, essentially, instead of moving left and right, you provide an address. And where can you get that address? You can get it out of the registers, right? You can get it out of the registers. And that is already something that you can like generate x86-64 assembly out of. So, yeah. So you can do also plus address, minus address. Yeah, you can actually get a lot of cool shit out of that idea. Right. So, yeah. It's, it's so freaking cool. <laughs> uh, I don't know. The, the thing about your machine is that at the first glance, it sounds like a freaking boring idea. Um... Am I hacked? I'm, I think I'm just lagging. Okay. So it sounds like a freaking boring idea. Uh, but once you like try to play with this idea, uh, you realize how freaking powerful it is. And imagine Turing came up with all of that shit alone without any freaking computers. So he came up with this shit to invent computers, right? <laughs> So it's just, it's freaking insane. Just going the same path that the Turing went and realizing all of these things that he probably also realized is fucking insane. It's just like, it's like, wow, what the fuck? <laughs>
Uh, right. And my ultimate goal, by the way, also going to be implementing a universal Turing machine, a Turing machine that can interpret other Turing machines. But I mean, effectively, if you implement rule 110, you basically did that. Right. So because rule 110 is Turing complete, so you're basically interpreting another Turing machine. Uh, right. So also, you know what would be cool? Implementing a brain fuck interpreting this. <laughs> um, I wonder how is he going to react to the state of programming today? I don't know, honestly, to be fair. Maybe he would not even recognize it as programming, to be fair, um, per se. Right. He would be probably more interested in whatever is going on in computer science. Mm. Though, the thing is, he was not a theoretical person. That's the thing. Right. So he was very much practical person. So everything he was doing is not doing like just, you know, for, for the sake of intellectual masturbation. It was also like really applicable in the real world. Um, yeah. So anyways, so I'm already streaming for one hour. I think it's time for me to make a small break and make a cup of tea. So, yeah. Mm. All right. So uh, let's continue. Let's continue working on this entire thing. And what's the next thing I want you to have in here? I don't really know. So, but let's actually go ahead and uh, go to the compilation error. So we still have compilation errors in here. So this is supposed to be cases, uh, right? So, and mm, so case state. Ah, right. So this is because I'm taking the first. Yeah, there we go. So program. Um, oh yeah, I see. I already have a program variable defined in here, which is the name of the program. Let's call it program name then. Uh, let's call it program name. So I guess it will make more sense then. Uh, and if I go into a find usage, so this is going to be program name. Uh, all right. So, and this one is also going to be program name. Um, what else do we have in here? Program name. There we go. There we go. So what else do we have in here? Okay. So this one is rather interesting, right? So we never actually handled the situation when we have an unknown key. Uh, maybe we need to report that then. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that. So this is going to be lock, uh, unknown keyword, unknown keyword. And we can put a name in here. Do we have a name in here? I think, uh, I think we do. Mm, yeah. So essentially I can say that the lock is going to be key lock and the name is going to be key name. Uh, there we go. And in here we're going to just return error like so um okay so do we have in here uh so now i'm gonna just go ahead and try to maybe test the ink uh right so obviously it's not gonna compile because we changed the syntax but that's fine right so this is gonna be odd bits and unknown keyword ink so what you're supposed to do in here you're supposed to put case so this is going to be just mode. I just realized that we don't have, um, what is it called? Comments, right? So we'll probably have to introduce the comments and there we go. It, that, that seems to be working. So we actually fixed this entire stuff. So let's test the deck, uh, the same thing. So we have to put a case in here. Uh, okay, cool. So what about the balanced parentheses? Uh, balanced, uh, balanced, and this is going to be parents, uh, par parents state. There we go. So for all of these things, we also have to put case. I wonder if I can easily, uh, so query replace anything that have at least something, right? So dot, uh, let's do query replace rejects, uh, right? So anything that has at least something, we're replacing it with case, like so, boom, can your Vim do that? It can do that, actually, I know. Uh, right, I know I use Vim. Don't worry about it. Don't get all wind up about that stuff. Uh, okay, so we got some subs. Uh, thank you so much for a tier one subscription with the message. Have you said about using the C preprocessor to code in Tula? Also, fuck you for tier <laughs> subscription motor. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I, I don't think so because for the preprocessor, I actually need to iterate, right? So I need four loops. Four loops in a C preprocessor are not that easy to implement. So yeah, I don't think it's going to be applicable, right? I don't think it's going to be applicable. And to be fair, I don't want the sort of like this additional language that adds four loops and if conditions and stuff like that. 
to be a separate language. I want it to be kind of integrated into the main language so uh, it is aware of the context of the main language. So it, I want it to be part of the whole system, right? So uh, the main problem with a uh, C preprocessor is that it's not a part of the main language. So they, they can't really reliably exchange information about like the, the types of the variables and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of the problem, right? So that's kind of the problem. So yeah, thank you so much for tier one. I'm really happy that you enjoyed the sub mod. All right, so uh, let me let me see. So thank you. you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. To be fair, like kind of the idea of C preprocessor is kind of bad, at least today. Maybe in 1969 it was okay when the computers were weaker and simpler and stuff like that. It kind of made sense made sense to separate these kind of things. Uh, today it, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, so when you do metaprogramming, that metaprogram wants to be aware about everything that is happening in the language, and that's the direction we're moving in with more modern languages, right? So especially something like Jai, I, I don't know if you ever worked with Jai, but in Jai, there's a lot of metaprogramming capabilities and it's literally the same language throughout. On all of the levels of metaprogramming, it's the same language throughout. It can get some information about some stuff it's generating and stuff like it's it's the same language. It's actually pretty cool and it's very, very, very much useful. So yeah, making all of that separate programs is gonna create a mess only. Uh, it's only gonna create a mess. So basically Lisp again. To be fair, I think John himself said that there was an inspiration with Lisp not a syntactical inspiration, but more of a semantical inspiration with Lisp, um, right? Because I remember in one of his streams he was talking about that, uh, right, so that metaprogramming capability of Lisp, nobody really, really recreated it in other language, languages, primarily because, uh, you know, as expressions and stuff like that, and what he's trying to do, he's trying to recreate that thing but without the s expressions and also with the static typing and also with the compilation and stuff like that right so because this is one of the things that lisp is lacking right so because essentially it's pretty cool that it has all of these metaprogramming capabilities but at its core it's not that different than python right so it's just an interpreted dynamic language at the end of the day right so which is kind of difficult to use for serious software development uh, Metacircular evaluation mentioned, yeah. So I, I, I guess you can say that Jai kind of has a metacircular meta like evaluation, but at compile time, right? So it's sort of at compile time, it, it kind of is kind of like that, I suppose. Maybe I don't know, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I haven't programmed in Jai for quite some time. Mm -mm. So, anyways, um, yeah. Okay, so let me see if the balance stuff working. The balance stuff is working. The balance stuff is to working. Absolutely progress, my friend. Uh, so, okay, let's maybe try to update the parents. So I'm going to um, define a set. What I want you to do, I want you to define a set. So JS mode, and here I'm going to say set uh let right it's called let parent uh, let's just call it parent and the parent is going to be something like this uh, but here is the problem right so the parent is going to have a special meaning right because we're going to have s expressions so maybe to you know that i mean parentheses literally i'll have to say something like that right so maybe there will be a special syntax that essentially allows you to reinterpret special symbols as just regular symbols by putting them in inside of the quotes right so i think i think it's fair right i think it's fair anyways so let's try to run this entire thing and uh yeah parsing sets is not implemented yet so there we go two two seven there we go so how are we going to be doing all of that so the first thing we need to do we need to take the um, uh, curly brace right so we need to take it curly brace uh, so it would be kind of nice if we had a function something like expect uh, symbol where we could put Alexa in there and we can say uh, maybe even several symbols right so just allow expecting several symbols uh, and the symbols that I'm gonna expect in here is gonna be 
um, you know, this thing, right? I'm expecting this symbol and I don't really care about this, so I'm gonna ignore it right away. Uh, the only reason I'm like taking it out of the left is just to check that it's there, right? So, and then here I also expect this thing and afterwards, um, right, so I'm just pulling the symbols between the open curly brace and the closed curly brace. And the reason why I wanna have several of them is to maybe reuse this function when I'm parsing the arrows. Right, so here, where I'm parsing, yeah, there we go. So here, where I'm parsing the arrows, uh, essentially can say expect symbol C, uh, right, and I can just say expect these specific symbols and effectively get rid of all of that stuff in here, right? So basically tuck uh, this entire check behind that function and reuse that function every time you expect a fixed amount of like, uh, fixed set of symbols, so to speak. Right, so let's try to define this function and see if we can implement that. So obviously it's going to have NSA. Uh, obviously it's going to have NSA. And then uh, we're going to just return what? Uh, just a symbol, right? So, and we're going to have expected names in here, right? So expected names. And uh, this is going to be just a slice of the strings. So I'm not sure if they're going to be behind the NSA thingy, but we'll see, we'll see. So maybe not, it doesn't really matter like what kind of lifetime they have, uh, right? Because we're going to be just like comparing them to, to the symbols. Uh, all right, so and essentially what we're going to do, we're going to parse the symbol, right? Uh, Alexa, just parsing the symbol, NSA, yeah. <laughs> um, right, and... I think that is basically it. So this is the symbol, uh, right? And afterwards, I think I can just iterate through the names. Name in expected names. Uh, and if symbol name equal to one of the expected names, we simply go ahead and return OK, that symbol. Right, if we iterated through all of the expected names and we didn't find anything expected, we have to report an error saying that expected one of those symbols, but got that shit. Um, right, so how are we gonna be doing all of that? We can maybe uh, organize some sort of a buffer, all right, so which is gonna be string. Um, so uh, we can call it, yeah, let's call it a buffer. And I'm going to iterate through the expected things in here. Uh, all right. And I just want to append them in there. Uh, all right. So I'm going to just write into the buffer. So this is going to be the name like so. And it's going to be separated by commas. But I suppose it would be better to enumerate all of these things right so now we have some sort of index in here and if index is equal to zero we're just doing that without any separation but if it's greater than zero we're going to be doing the uh the separation like so uh right so and there we go so now we can say expected buffer but got name Right, but got something else, I suppose. It got symbol. Um, so name, symbol, name. There we go. So another thing that I like to do in here is that for the last one to put some sort of a or, I already done that several times, right? So if you have several things in here, A, B, C, D, you want to basically separate them like that. And for the last one, you want to put or right if you know what i mean so for the last one you want to put or um so in essentially how can we check that if i is equal to maybe even i plus one is equal to expected names length uh right um i can do one off right so but it's kind of it feels very robotic you know what I'm talking about? It feels very robotic. I really like when it's that. Right, so when you say one of these things, it gives it off immediately as automatically generated. But if you have two variants, like uh, C or D, it just automatically kind of looks nice, if you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't really feel, you know, robotic or automatically generated. Right, if you have several of them. Uh, if you start having a lot of them, it does feel automatically generated, but uh, yeah. So I don't know how to explain that. I just like it a little bit better. 
Uh, but it is automatically generated. Yeah, but we don't want the user to suspect that. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like an, an aesthetic, uh, aesthetic decision, right? I don't really know how to explain that. I just feel like it. I'm an artist. I see that way. You know, you know what I'm talking about? I'm an artist. I'm a performance artist. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so, yeah. So essentially going to be like that. And if you have two of them, so only these two conditions will fire off effectively. The vision, yes. The vision. The end vision that I have in there. Uh, so, yesu, 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 kawaii freaking desu. Uh, all right, so let's maybe um, go through all of these things. So, um, I wanted to uh, compile this entire stuff. Um, all right, so what do we have? Uh, name, string, oof. Oh, that's very interesting. So, when I was iterating slides, it was not considering them it's like pointers. That's so bizarre, honestly. Huh. All right. Um, so iter. Maybe because of the, it's kind of weird that for the symbol name I had to do this kind of thing. That is so bizarre. What if I do it like that? Uh, is it going to nah? It, I like I literally have to do it like that. That's so bizarre. Like why symbol name is all of a sudden dereferenced? I have no idea, honestly. So, right, yeah, yeah, so that may sort of cause errors, but it never will cause errors because we're writing into a string. Uh, right, so we're writing into a string. Um, all right, all right, all right. So that seems to be compiling. Look at that. That's pretty cool. So, and now, actually, so when we parse in this step, we don't really have to do that anymore. And in fact, parsing the step is not really needed anymore at all. We can just say, uh, right, yeah, expect symbols, and that illuminates this entire thing. So when I'm parsing the case, it's just like for all of these things, I'm parsing the symbols, and here I'm expecting only these two symbols, and that is very much reusable across all of that stuff. Okay, so now I can do the following thing. I can pick into the thing, pick the symbol, and pick symbol returns options. So that means I have to do something while let uh, sum uh, symbol, right? And I suppose if symbol name for whatever reason equal to closing thing, I'm kind of breaking off of that. Uh, but otherwise, um, I can do the following thing. I can do next symbol. And that eliminates the need to do this kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, uh, and I suppose I just need to collect the symbols. All right, so let's do mutable set, which is going to be just a vector. All right, so this is just a vector. And I'm just like pushing all of the symbols that I collected in here and here, and I just return it like that. Look at that. I figured it out. I figured out how to parse the sets. Isn't that up? almost, almost? I forgot the semicolon. Uh, but now I figured it out. I'm going to sneeze, by the way. Get ready, chat. Get ready. It's fucking cut. <sighs> False alarm. I'm sorry. <clears throat> This happens sometimes, don't worry about it. Anyways, uh, so every time I parse a set, every time I manage to parse a set, uh, all right, so I think I need to print that just for the debug purposes because I want to see that. Uh, set defined, set may be uh, something like name defined, and maybe we're also going to print that specific set because I want to just try to see that. Um, and this one is going to be something like that. Yeah, there we go. So we have in here, so we can manage to compile this entire thing. And then I'm going to try to do that. And yeah, so equals is not supposed to be here. And as you can see, it's working. And uh, here is the set, <laughs> right? So, but I mean, it's just like a sequence of symbols and symbols contain the values and also their locations and stuff like that. But here we can see two symbols within the set, right? So, and it's not really a set because it allows repeating things. So it's maybe it should be called sequence, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, maybe it should be called sequence. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And how can we use it now? Uh, by the way, I want to query replace all of these things with uh, this kind of stuff. 
All right. So because yeah, uh, parentheses have a special meaning. So if I mean parentheses literally, I need to have a separate syntax for that. Uh, so right now, Lexa does not distinguish. It doesn't understand single quotes. It just basically splits by space. And because of that, it works out, right? So, but maybe I'll come up with the Lexa that kind of like does something with all of that. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. So there we go. And for the tape, for the tape in here, I kind of want to do a similar thing, uh, right? But because of that, I will have to separate those things by, by spaces. So we're going to start with this thing, boom. And then uh, we're going to start with the uh, other way around. There we go. So in here, I can also enable JS mode, right? So, yeah. Because I feel like even within the tape file, maybe we'll, we'll allow to have S expressions. Maybe one of the things we will allow is actually have an entire expressions as the value of the cell. Because why not? Right. So, yeah, we can store information like that within those things. Um, anyways, so, yeah. Now, how can I already use whatever I have in here? For example, I can simplify this thing. For instance, one of the things I can do in here is to simplify this thing. So, for instance, I can say p in parent, and then I can do case uh, p, 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 like so. Um, uh, finally, code is data, or whatever Lisp near talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so, essentially, that should kind of generate two conditions, uh, right? So, because we're iterating through. Uh, through the set and for each set we define this sort of thing right so that's basically the idea if i try to compile this entire thing it's obviously not going to compile because there's no such keywords in here uh, so this is something that we'll have to parse in here as well uh, right let's go ahead and do that so this is going to be four and uh, boom so when we do four we need to have a name of the variable so it's called var and i'm going to say just parse uh, parse symbol. Um, so we actually picked and then we, yeah, okay, so that's fine. So we parse the symbol and that's the variable name. Uh, then we kind of expect, expect symbol. And what kind of symbol do we expect in here? We expect in specifically, right? So because we have 4p in parent and so on and so forth. Uh, all right, so, and in here, what we can do, um, we now need to do another one. So set uh, parse symbol. So that's the set, and this is going to be the lexicon. So and afterwards, uh, we have to generate the case, right? So, yeah, to be fair, we need a more general way to to work with all of that because we're gonna have like nested for loops and stuff like that but we will add all of that a little bit later uh right so and i suppose how are we gonna be storing all of that i feel like for loops for loops should be special cases of cases right so it's sort of like a special case of the case where one of the things here are parameterized, if that makes any sense. Right. By the way, it would be kind of cool to uh, even have this kind of situation where I could define something like arrows and arrows are literally that. So then I can iterate through the arrows uh, like so and have a case that if I'm in... Uh, some sort of a state, right, which also has an arrow associated with it, right, so, and I encounter, for example, one, I leave it as it is, I move in the direction that is within that state. And I switch to something like, uh, you know, next or whatever. That is such a powerful idea. Actually parameterizing the direction in which you can, this is so freaking cool. You can do that because the arrows are also symbols, right? So the arrows are also symbols. Uh, but that kind of fucks up the parsing, right? So because the part in the parser, we hard coded that we need to have an error in here, but we can at some point then hard code that anyway, right? Maybe arrow is going to be um, a special set that is also always predefined. And one of the things we need to have in here is that when you parse in this entire thing, uh, it has to be of the type of arrow, right? 
Yo, this is actually so cool, but we'll implement it a little bit later. We'll implement it a little bit later for sure. Mm -mm. Anyways, so four has to be a special sort of case. So struct case. Because of that, I think instead of struct in here, what we have to have, we have to have enumeration. Let's call this enumeration statement. Right. And so essentially here, what you can have is case statement. Right. So this is going to be the case statement and a for statement like so. And a for statement is going to have the variable, which is a symbol. All right. So this is an NSA and a set, which is also a symbol. Right. So you're iterating for bar in that set. And then you need to have a body, which is going to be the statement like so. Right, and it's supposed to be, I guess, box or something, right? So, because it's like a nested structure in here. Um, right, so now we are starting to have an AST, right? So, we literally have an AST. <sighs> so, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, building up this entire thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But maybe we should use that trick where you have a, like an array of those statements and actually the body points somewhere like with the index to the next statement or something like that. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see. So I will experiment that with that a little bit later. Okay, so let me try to recompile the entire thing and see how it goes. And yeah, so since we changed this entire thing so dramatically, what we'll have to do, we'll have to uh, go to the compilation errors a little bit. Uh, right, so we'll have to go to the compilation errors a little bit, so we'll see how much time it will take us to to do all of that. Okay, so here, uh, yeah, I'm putting cases, but yeah, now this entire thing is called statements, right? And I suppose that's exactly what we have to do. Honestly, is that a good thing to call it a statement? Yeah, I think I think we can call it statement. Yeah, so let's go ahead and just iterate through all these things. Parse. Uh, yeah, parse case, uh -huh. yeah, we have to call it a case, so this is going to be a statement, but maybe you know what, mm, I'm just thinking, honestly, so what if I just have a statement as a separate thing, uh, and as a separate structure in here. Is that a good idea? Will it make it a little bit easier? Because I can't really predict it if it's going to be a little bit easier for us to work with or not. I'm really not sure. Uh, right, so we can do something like that. And the case is going to be a thing that encapsulates the case. But for the for loop, we have this kind of thing. So is it going to be easier for us or is it not going to be easier for us? I'm not sure. Mm -mm. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, but if I want to do renaming, I really want to get rid of the case type. So maybe, uh, yeah, maybe for the time being, I'm going to actually do it like that. All right. So and in here, this is going to be statement because of that. Maybe this thing is going to be statement. Uh, there we go. So this is going to be the statement. And uh, here, this is going to be statement case. Right, so specifically we're doing the case thing. Um, now, it has to be the case. It has to be the case. Uh, all right, so program statement, and this is going to be statements. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, uh, statement. Uh, so it's called state, but it's not case. Okay, this one is very interesting. All right, all right. So, this is where we have to start doing all of that shit, right? So, this is where we have to start doing all of that shit and looking up things. Um, so, we need to, for this statement, have a special thing, honestly. So, let me find struct statement. Uh, where, well, I mean... It's an enumeration statement. Yeah, let's have an implementation for this thing because I think it will need some special methods in here. Statement uh, and say. So, and I want to have a function that accepts the state of the machine, right? So a symbol and a say. Um, and also it accepts the read, also the symbol, right? So it accepts that. 
And then what it should return, it should return right arrow and the next, right? So it, need, it needs to return all of these things in there. Uh, right, so let me see. So it's going to be symbol, NSA, uh, NSA, symbol, NSA. Right, so it needs to return this thing. But here is the thing. If this statement doesn't fit this entire thing, it should not return anything. So it has to be option, so to speak. Right, it has to be option. Um, right, so let's call it to match. Well, it's already taken, god damn it. Okay, match state. Uh, right, so we do match state. Uh, and also we have to accept ourselves. Right, and d depending on what kind of statement do we have? Do we have a case statement, just a case statement, or we have a for statement? We're gonna do that differently. For the for statement, by the way, we'll have to kind of do that recursively, I think. We'll have to do that recursively, and this is actually a very interesting thing. Um, right, so let me let me see. Um, so we can match self, and if this is statement uh, case, this is actually super straightforward, honestly. Um, this is actually super straightforward. And by the way, here, I feel like having this as a separate structure would actually help a little bit, just a tiny bit. So yeah, maybe, maybe I'm going to actually extract it. Uh, all right. So I'm still not sure if I want to extract it or not, honestly. So switch me, please. Thank you so much for your one subscription. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. So yeah, I will copy pasted the name. That's fine. Uh -huh, so yeah, and here we're going to have a case and uh, yeah, and essentially the reason why I did it like that is because now I can do uh, something like case, right? And then I can say if case um, state equals state in here, and we have to actually compare the names, uh, right? Names um, and case read equal to whatever read we have in here, also the names. Uh, we just return, we just return some. Uh, case right case step case next right so we match this thing otherwise we return nothing right so if the statement is just case it's actually pretty straightforward to match it uh, if the statement is for that's a little bit more difficult right so we have a, a var uh, set and var set and body and essentially what I'm expecting to have in here is some sort of a recursive situation. Some sort of a recursive situation where uh, I'm matching, like forwarding this check inside. Right, I'm forwarding this check inside, but as I'm forwarding this thing inside, I need to replace, uh, right, I need to replace these wars accordingly in there. I need to replace them according in there. And the question is how exactly I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. So maybe this statement is going to have some sort of a method that constructs a new statement with a replacement. Uh, right. So here I have a set and I need to get the symbols in that set. So that means I need to have an access to the sets in here, right? I need to have an access to the sets in here and the sets is actually hash map uh, that maps the name to some other things and stuff like that. Or maybe I should accept like straight up an entire program, uh, right? I'm accepting straight up an entire program and maybe I'm gonna be accepting it somewhere here. Right, so it's gonna be program uh, NSA. There we go, so this is a program NSA. And in here, I can just simply take a program um, sets and I can try to get the set name in here. Right. And if I manage to get uh, the set in here, so something like if, how I'm going to call it actually set symbols. I'm going to call it like that for now. I'm not really happy with this kind of thing. But nonetheless, if we didn't find that set, we have to actually report an error. 
we have to actually report an error. So that means we add an additional layer of complexity in here, which is a result, right? So it has to be okay, right? So basically this is the triple of uh, right, um, right step and next, and it might be missing because it didn't match, but on top of that, it may error out because as we were trying to match, like we were, we were trying to refer to a thing that doesn't exist at all. So, um, so it's kind of like a, I suppose, normal situation in Rust, right? So you, you can have this kind of things. So in here, we're gonna have an error, uh, which basically returns like nothing. And we need to report an error. So it's gonna be like reported at location, and we can say error, unknown set, uh, unknown set name, uh, like so. I'm not sure if you can see this, shice. Location is going to be basically set location, and the name is going to be set name like so and i suppose here we have to actually do set name like so okay so yeah we've got this thing we've got the set symbols so we can try to maybe iterate them uh so let's actually call them symbols right so it's going to be symbol in symbols symbol in symbols and as we iterate them again as i already said i feel like there should be the statements themselves so body is a statement uh, the statements themselves should have some sort of a, like a substitution, substitute, uh, substitute, where I specify, okay, substitute that symbol within the entire statement with that symbol. And that should create a completely new statement with that thing substituted in there. And we can try to match that thing uh with the substituted thing so match state so and we're gonna forward the program in there uh right so we're gonna forward the program and by the way program probably should be passed by a reference in here um so yeah so this is gonna be state and read and so we do this substitution and here is an interesting thing of course it may fail um all right it may fail so I'm not sure if substitution is a fine idea in here. Maybe it's fine. Right, it may fail. And also uh, it either returns something or it doesn't return something. Uh, right, so it may return the triple, the triple. And if we get that triple, we instantly return this entire thing. So otherwise, if we went through all of the symbols and we didn't find any of the matching substitutions, right? So we simply return an error right away so we can actually do something like that so since it's a triple we have to do something like okay uh honestly yeah so yeah that's what we have to do um some triple okay yeah mm, and here we have to return actually okay none right so because it was it didn't error but we didn't match of this any of these things. It's a pretty complex thing, right? So, and maybe not particularly optimal, but this is something that we'll have to do, right? So, and in here, as, let's do substitute, uh, substitute, and we're going to accept obviously self. Uh, we're going to accept the variable, which is the symbol uh, of NSA, and the the symbol the substitution symbol that we want to actually substitute it with uh, and it's going to produce a completely new statement completely new statement with the substituted thing uh right so this is basically what it, like how i expect to implement for so it's kind of like generation but we're generating one substitution and we instantly forgetting it right so yeah, I think that's the way to go. Obviously, none of that is going to compile because I was just like pulling the code out of my ass without compiling or checking anything. But I mean, um, we may start the compiler assisted refactoring session and just like, yeah, you know, check all of that stuff. Okay, so let's go and see how it's going to go. Mind the front. So here is the case and it's supposed to be NSA. NSA. Uh, right, so it doesn't implement debug. Does it really have to? It can, we can implement a bug for that, sure. Uh, all right, so substitute doesn't really like something in here. Argument to this is incorrect. Um, so what do you want? Expected symbol, but found symbol. Honestly, why don't we accept all of this shit by reference? Like who said that, yeah, so these things doesn't have to be 
uh, copy it in there, right? So because we're just comparing things, right? So we can just do it like that. Uh, right, so let me see. Arguments to this method are incorrect. So yeah, because we're doing the substitution. So when I'm substituting this thing, I'm kind of moving this thing in there. Or do I? Um, I'm not quite sure. To be fair, can I just like dereference all of these things? I don't know. Symbol is such a lightweight um, structure. We can just copy it. We, we don't really have to do that. Uh, right. So I think it's a super lightweight thing. No field state. Oh, yeah. This one is interesting. Yeah. So we went back to where we had a problem, right? So this is where we have to do the matching and shit like that. So before how we did the matching, we did it like that. Right. So which is understandable. Um, Mm -mm -mm. Now, we don't really have cases, we have statements, right? And we're iterating statements, statement, um, statements. So what we're doing here, we just do the matching, uh, statement, uh, match state. What we have to do in here, we have to provide the program. We don't have a program in here, so we'll have to get it from somewhere. Uh, right, so, <laughs> wait, wait, baby wait um so what we have to do we have to take the state uh so this is our state and in the match state i accept them yeah just so they're just like that self read so and if we found anything in here so right step next uh-huh we we'll just do it like that, right? So, and that's basically going to be the body, by the way, of this entire thing. That's the body. It's just instead of case, we just use right directly. Then for this step, we do that. And the next is just that. So, yeah, so matching the specific statement became a little bit more complicated, but it's worth it, hopefully. Hopefully it is actually worth it. We'll see, we'll see. So let's go to the rest of the compilation errors. Um, yeah, so, so the interpretation of this language becomes rather complicated, honestly. Um, statements, right, so it's, it's a serious language. It's a serious language now. So we don't have a program. I suppose we have to accept it. Let's accept it. Program, uh, problem. Um, so, and it's probably going to be, why is this is not NSA? Excuse me, it must be an old code. It must be NSA. Uh -huh. NSA. This is also NSA. Honestly, this one, I'm not sure if it has to be like that. Mm, we'll see. Uh -huh. So, key is a step uh, location. Okay, so it's kind of cool. Since we know the location, we can even tell you at like the exact position where it overflown in the code, right? So, it's a very super convenient, I think. Uh, underflowed, actually, not overflown. Um, so match state, so we're matching, so this is a self state, uh -huh. and the read is whatever we have in the tape, yeah, that's for sure, so it has to be tape, uh, self head, right, what else do we have in here, so, oh yeah, and this thing may fail, so that means we have to put a question mark at the end in here, right, so, uh, we're almost there, I think. We're almost there. So we're, when I'm parsing the case, so it doesn't like something. Uh, case does. Oh yeah, I see, I see. So it has to be something like this case. Uh -huh. Boom. What else do we have in here? So program cases. Okay, so now it is a statement, All right? So this is going to be a statement. <clears throat> Since we have this recursive structure, so statement is a recursive thing, as we already established, right? So statement is a recursive thing. So for refers back to statement, which allows you to do these kind of things recursively, right? Uh, so what that means is that we need to factor out these two things to 
sort of like parse this statement, if that makes any sense. Right, so uh, let me see, parse statement. Um, so we're going to have NSA in here, and this is going to be the Lexa. So let's actually even copy paste this entire stuff. Uh, so, and we're going to be returning one of the statements, right? So this is going to be just a statement. Okay. Um, and essentially, when we refer to this thing, we're going to be expecting one of these keywords. Um... It's kind of annoying that um, let is not really a statement, right? It is not really a statement, so it's kind of annoying, honestly. But anyway, so uh, let's have a key in here. So, and we're going to ex be expecting specific symbols in here, right, from, from the Lexa. So what kind of symbols do we have? We expect a case or we expect four, nothing particularly special. And let me copy paste this kind of stuff in here. Right, so this is going to be that. Uh, a let is not one of them. Uh, so a known keyword. Uh -huh. Honestly, I think we're going to mark this as unreachable. Mm, I'm going to mark it as unreachable. Right, because I think it's going to be checked a little bit like before calling this function. Um, right. So this enables me to do the following thing. Uh, essentially, I can just parse the body, like so, parse statement recursively like this. So I encountered four, then I took a war, var in set, and then I parse the, another statement, which allows me to have several nested force in there. So that's quite important, several nested force. So yeah. So, and afterwards, like, I, can, I can basically wrap it into the box right away uh, and just return it, I suppose. So here I'm actually pushing it. So what I have to do instead, in fact, is just like return it. Uh, right, so here we're parsing the case. Uh, and where am I parsing the case? So where is it defined? So maybe I want to actually put this stuff in here. Uh, Mark77, thank you so much for uh, subscription with a message. Tremenda tuba. I hope I said something funny in Spanish. Uh, Tremenda. Does it mean big dick? Right, so because tremendous. Right. Okay, I see. Thank you. Right, so it's kind of like a, from Latin language. Okay, so that, that makes sense. I see, I see, I see. That's cool. Uh, I always wanted to like learn one of the Latin languages. I think it's going to be like very useful for the for the general vocabulary uh, vocabulary because Latin la Latin actually influenced so many languages like European languages and I feel like if you know for instance Spanish or, or Portuguese, you just generally understand European languages better like automatically just because of the vocabulary. Uh, just my hypothesis. Um, and, Anyway, uh, all right, so here we return that, and by the way, since I'm doing the case, maybe it makes sense to return the case, like so. Uh, Portuguese is nice, I'm not biased at all, I see. Uh, all right, so and in here I can just do it like that. And so... Yeah, this one is basically this. I'm parsing the case, but I'm also right away saying that this is going to be the statement case, like so. So in here I can do statement four, which is just var, set, and body. Uh, uh, all right, so that's pretty cool. So one of the problem in here is that I'm parsing this shit right away. Uh, and I suppose what I want to do in here, I want to kind of peek into this symbol, right? So I'm parsing the symbol right away. Um, so is there any easy way for me to do that? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I think maybe there is. Uh, so I'm going to do Lexa peak uh, symbol. But the problem with the peak symbol is that um, it's optional thing it's an optional thing so maybe because of that i want to kind of map it like so 
I can get the name and that gives me the name so then I can do some this is so dumb honestly <laughs> it's probably not gonna work um, all right it's probably not going to work uh, yeah so case four and so if I encounter one of these things if I encounter one of these things uh, so um, mm, so if we could create sort of forum for sodium community I'm not doing that uh, I have already enough work to manage in discord and comments and stuff like that all right I'm not getting more work for free for myself thank you so much all right, so this is uh, super annoying. Uh, how can I do all of that? So I want to be able to, man, man. Mm. I want to be able to say, okay, so pick one of the, uh, so pick in, in this thing and if it's an end, mm, I don't know, man. But to be fair, it's not going to be actually end, honestly. So I can pick pretty safely into this thing. Yeah, so essentially I can, okay, so I think I can turn this into the following thing. Yeah, I can do let some key, like so, uh, right. Okay, okay, so that's cool. That's cool, that's cool. So it's gonna be case four, and then I can do that. Okay, so that, that actually makes it a little bit easier. Uh, all right, so here is a statement, but here I would have to actually get rid of this symbol, so it's gonna be next symbol, like so. Uh, and hopefully that is not, yeah, so hopefully borrow checker is not gonna checkmate me on that. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Because I feel like borrow checker is gonna checkmate me. Um, okay, let's go. So key a name, uh, so yeah, this one has to be uh, like this. So statement case. So what you don't like in here, so because, uh, yeah, this one have to be okay. I see, I see. So this one also has to be okay. All right, what else do we have in here? Okay, so far so good. Var symbol found result var. Yeah, so all of these things also have to be with a question mark, right? So because they all can fail. Uh, what else do we have in here? Uh, this one has to be name. Okay, so far I don't see any checkmate. Uh, all right, statement s. Nothing actually. Okay, parse. Yeah, parse statement. This we are parsing the entire statement, so that's cool. Uh, all right. So, okay, this one is actually rather interesting. This one. So because we are figuring out what's going to be the first ever state. So we take in the first statement, right? So we take in the first statement. Um, all right, and this is going to be the statement. But depending on what kind of statement we have in here, man, that actually sucks, honestly. That actually sucks. So essentially, what if the first ever statement is a for loop? What if the first ever statement is a for loop? So essentially, let me let me show you. Right. So if we put this kind of thing, I guess we can basically take the first symbol in here, take the first symbol, and consider the first case to be this thing all right and we just take the state uh, state of the first thing in here and the reason why i worry about that is because you can actually substitute not only the uh, reads and writes in here but also the states right who said you can't do this kind of thing you should be able to do this kind of thing so in my opinion so and essentially what we have to do in here i suppose is in the statement um, uh, statement entry state we need to be able to return an entry state right so that's what we have to do in here an entry state so let's go to the 
struct statement. Uh, is it struct? It's, in, um, uh, it's actually implementation, but with NSA shit. Uh, right, so entry state. Entry state, we're going to take the self. Uh, all right, and we're going to return actually the symbol, which is going to be, you know, the entry thing. Uh, right, so, uh, and depending on what we have in here, so it's either going to be uh, uh, the statement case. In case of case, haha, it's actually super easy. You just return case um, state, right? So that's the first state. In case of the for loop, it's a little bit more interesting. Uh, right, so for you have var, you have uh, set, and you have the body, right? So as already said, what we're going to do, we're going to take the first element of the set, but to do that, we need to look up that set, right? So we already have a little bit of a code to look up the set. I'm going to grab that code, steal it a little bit, just a tiny bit, because it's my code anyway, so I'm allowed to steal my own code chat, okay? Right, so unknown set, blah, blah, blah. And in here we get the symbols, right? So, and we get the first symbol, right? So symbol first, and this one is rather interesting. So what if, can you allow sets be empty? This is very interesting. Can you allow the sets be empty? So can we just say, okay, so this thing is empty. I think technically there is like right now you can do that and this loop becomes useless so it is illuminated uh, it is illuminated uh, right so essentially that for does not generate anything which means by the way that a particular statement may not produce any rules this is a very fascinating thing that I didn't think about. So a statement, right? So a statement can produce several rules, but if the set we iterating is empty, it does not produce any rules. So that means this is optional, which means to figure out the entry state, you have to iterate all of the statements and find the one that gives you the first entry state. Um, it's such a noisy language. I think the main noise comes from this shit. If Rust developers can figure out how to get rid of this shit, this is going to be magnitude's nicer language, honestly. And it's not like, like how often you need more than one lifetime in here, right? Like for real. It's just like you end up with just like a single thing that you have to copy paste everywhere for whatever freak. Like maybe like I don't have that much experience in Rust where I really needed that, but I mean. Uh, so they, they they try to introduce the uh, like illusion rules or something like that. I don't really understand them. So it's, it's so bizarre. But anyway, um, whatever. Um, okay, so the state may not produce that. So maybe we can try this idea. So, uh, so I'm going to take the first one. And essentially, if let some uh, symbol, right, so I'm going to do that. Uh, right, so this is my first symbol. And what I want to do in here, I'm going to take the body and substitute that body with that first symbol and then take the entry state from that, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's going to return something or not. Otherwise, I suppose what we have to do, we have to return just option just none but here is an interesting thing as you're trying to figure out the entry state you can error out because you're referring to the state that doesn't exist so that you mean you have additional layer in here of yeah <laughs> uh right so it's just like that yeah there we go uh i guess i guess it's fine sure Sure, sure. So since this is a result, it's going to work. So this is okay, but it doesn't produce anything. This is error. And I suppose we figured out all of these things. So in this case, we're going to say it's okay with the sum state in here, right? So this is an entry state. Um, right. So I guess that make kind of sense. Mm. Mm -mm. Honestly, I don't understand the need uh, for the lifetime annotation either. I never needed them in any other language. Here's the interesting thing. They sound great on paper, in theory. 
in practice <laughs> right <laughs> so like in theory that they, they do make sense they do make a lot of sense all right but when like the real life code is just like what the fuck is this why do we have to write so much freaking noise just for that for that simple thing uh, it feels like maybe the Rust developers had a very specific use case in mind, which is not generally applicable to like everything, and we ended up with this. Um, so, I don't know. Um, so it's purely syntactical problem, I suppose. I feel like it's a purely syntactical problem, right? So, for the common case, there should be a better um, syntax for that. So here we're accepting the problem, right? Um, so let's put the program in here. Honestly, we probably only need to accept the sets. Ah, uh, let's accept the entire program. But I'm, I'll probably, uh, you know, refactor that a little bit later uh, off screen. So entry state. So yeah, we have to provide the program like so. Uh, so what do we have here? Yeah, there we go. So now when I, when I have the statements, I don't have to actually take the first one I have to iterate them so what I have to do now so that's the that's the thing here for statement in statements and I'm probably gonna be iterating them by reference and stuff like that um, right so what I have to do is probably find can I have like find map in here that sounds like a cool idea let me see rust up doc maybe I already have it open yeah so do you have something like find map um you do have okay what the fuck did you open <laughs> fuck's sake brother oh it, it's loading okay Jesus so yeah it it, it it accepts the function that returns an option okay okay that makes sense so th that means I can do a thing like uh, find map where I get the statement and a statement is essentially entry state. Yeah, again, I can just like assign it like that. And interestingly, okay, so it may fail because of different reasons, right? So because this entire thing, okay, that's annoying. Ah, oh, fuck me. Okay, so uh, let's put none in here then. Uh, we're gonna be doing that imperative style. Was thinking maybe I can do that Haskell style, but fuck that. Okay. Uh, right, so if we encounter an error, we'll have to report an error nonetheless. So if statement, so do we, yeah, okay. So that means I can right away do a pretty cool thing. Statement entry, uh, entry state, question mark. That will report an error. I don't have to do anything. Then some uh, state, um, yeah. And then that's kind of a stupid thing because I can't really return out of the, yeah, whatever, some uh, state like so, and then just break out of that, break out of that. And then here, if uh, state, mm, is there any nice way to do that? Oh. Uh, is there any nice way to do this? I need another cup of tea chat. I need another cup of tea for this shit. But I mean, I, it's, I'm almost done in here. I'm almost done in here. Uh, I'm almost done. So, uh, yeah. So what's going to be a better way to do that? Whatever, I'm going to do something dumb. Uh, I'm going to do freaking something dumb. You know, I, I need a small break. All right, let's make a small break. Um, all right, so what I want to do, I think I want to kind of like move this stuff uh, outside into sort of like a separate function. So I'm going to just return actually result option uh, symbol. S as actually single symbol. NSA. Uh, all right, and as over here, suppose here we're going to accept the statement S. And it's gonna be just something like this statement. Uh, Jesus Christ, I'm having a hiccup. I'm fucking dying. Um, so entry state. So this is what we're gonna call it. 
Uh, so where are the statements? Uh, statements. So let's move that shice in there. Entry state. Find me that goddamn freaking function, mate. So here it is. So entry state, and it requires a program, by the way. So when you do an entry state, it requires a program. So because of that, maybe I have to do a program. And because of that, maybe it makes sense to accept program by a reference in here and say so. And in here, when we found that thing, I want to right away just return OK. Uh, OK, OK, st uh, some statement like so. Otherwise, we're going to be returning an... Um, okay none right so that's how i want to approach this entire thing statements so and in here what we're going to be doing uh entry entry state program and honestly maybe entry state should be a method of the program why not entry uh entry state that sounds like a poor's idea honestly so let me find implementation of NSA program. Do, do you have a implementation for the program? You probably don't. Eh, you freaking yeah, I see. You don't. Got you. Got you. All right. So NSA program NSA. So we don't have to do that stuff anymore. And this becomes just self just self and this is what we can do in here that's pretty cool uh statements okay so that means here i can do program state then i can do something like that and if let some state we're gonna basically return that state return that state let state or we're gonna throw an error saying that uh, the two of them must have at least one case. Sounds good. And that's basically what I want to do in here. Roughly. 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 Okay, let's go and try to compile this into horrible shit. Okay, so this is a self statement. Sure. What else do we have in here? And when I do entry program, can I just put self in there? Uh, or is it basically going to be checkmated by borrow checker? Uh, okay, so that was fine. So in here I can just do program. Uh, okay, I want to do okay. So fn next. Um, yeah. So it's kind of funny how we accept the entirety of the program and the statements, but statements are part of the program. So that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of bizarre, honestly. Uh, anyways, uh, so what do we have in here? So statements. It's a program. Uh, right. What, the, what else do we have in here? So, okay, finally, uh, add explicit lifetime NSA, uh, really, okay, 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 explicit lifetime NSA, uh, we're almost there, I feel like we're almost there, chat, I have a feeling, I have a feeling uh, that we're almost there, program statement, s iter, holy shit, I won. Zulu. I won borrow checker. Holy fuck. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Have you ever thought of probability that everyone in chat from Russia but nevertheless speaks English for some reason? Uh, actually, majority of the viewers I have are from USA. So Russia is usually on the third or fourth place. On the second place is Germany. I don't need to guess, I have numbers, I have analytics, so... <laughs> like 20% of the viewers from USA. Okay, con hell yeah, brother! <clears throat> That's why he says shy is the problem. Um, uh, why would I call, call my language Tula? Because um, it means dick in Spanish, that's why. Um, <laughs> 
literally why not because it's a russian city i don't care about russian cities but because it's a dick in spanish that, that's the actual reason so uh nikin c thank you so much for uh Tevan subscription with the message thanks to you i learned both english programming and different kinds of approaches imagine learning english from a foreigner like english is not the first first language for me as well so you probably learned like a broken english <laughs> but i mean I'm, I'm happy that i helped you to learn english T to be fair personally i was also learning english by watching pewdiepie back in the days back in back in amnesia days so and what's funny is that at the time when i was listening to him it, it felt like oh, wow his english is so good and then i look back at those old videos like with amnesia and he has such a strong swedish accent like holy fuck and i didn't hear that back then because i also didn't speak english so it's just it's really funny actually um <clears throat> And how majority of people learn English? Yeah, I guess so. We sort of like learning English together, uh, right? Um, <clears throat> All right. So let's continue. So everything seems to be compiling. If I try to now, maybe uh, try to run the increments and the odd bits. Uh, it seems to be working, so that's cool. Now, the interesting thing, uh, balanced, this is where we do the generation and parents. Uh, that kind of worked, but not really. Then it stopped. Okay, so the funny thing is that it didn't break at all, surprisingly. Uh -huh. Oh, this is because the parents is empty. Okay, so that makes sense. Okay, so let's actually fill them up with something. Uh, like so and also maybe get rid of this entire thing all right let's let's get rid of this entire stuff there we go so finally we got unimplemented uh right and finally we need to implement the last piece of the puzzle uh replacement uh, we need to implement replacement so we have to construct a completely new statement where we replace a variable with a new symbol uh right so we need to find this thing and replace it replace it with something it's kind of a dumb way to do that it would be way better to have some sort of like maybe scope system but i will think about a better system uh, off screen already right so as for now what we're doing right now in here uh right so this is a compound expression so essentially this is a high level statement for and it has a recursive like inner statement body so essentially what we do we iterate through each element of the set uh, and then within the body we replace each occurrence of p with that element and then we check that case right so th this is basically what we're doing here like we literally do substitutions we copy this case we do one single replacement uh right check if the current state of the machine fits there then we do the next one and the next one and the next one so that's basically how it works i'm not sure if it's a good idea because it's really close to pre-processing essentially right it's like pre-processing but we're forgetting some of the keys um all right so maybe there's something more efficient in here we'll see we'll see something more efficient would be to maybe uh look at the case look at the value and see if it's within the certain set and sort of assign that there is some way to to optimize that uh there's some way to optimize that but for now we're gonna i think we're gonna do like a very dumb simple way anyway so let's match the self thinking and in case of the case right so this is going to be statement uh case uh right uh, in case of the case, uh, so what kind of things do we have in the case? Um, so struct case. So we have state, read, state, read, write, step, next. Okay, this one is interesting. Um, so we have to maybe sequentially check all of these things. Uh, maybe we're going to do it like that if state if state name equal to var name we replace it with a symbol yeah. uh, symbol otherwise we're using original state in here and i suppose we kind of want to repeat that for all of these things for read 
uh, for right and for I'm not sure about the step though. Uh, right, so this is gonna be read. Maybe I'm gonna actually put stuff like that. So yeah, yeah so that's better. That's even easier to read. Uh, right, so this one is gonna be read right. We're not gonna replace the um, uh, the step though. Align equals uh, align else. Might as well also align. Yeah, so that's that's much better. Pretty cool. So and next. Eh, could replace right next. So and essentially what we want to do in here is construct a completely new statement. So this is going to be statement uh, case, but this is going to be case. I can't even copy paste this entire thing, I think. Um, so let's do a to do. To do substitute um, step. So right now we can't really substitute step is because uh, trying to put a variable into the step is not going to even parse properly. It's not going to even parse properly because the parser explicitly expects the symbol arrows. So we need to update the parser to even enable that. Uh, we need to update the parser to enable that. Uh, all right. <clears throat> uh, we also need to do some runtime checks to ensure that um, only things from the arrow uh, arrow set are put in um, in the step. Uh, so let arrow is basically looks like this. So that's the definition of the arrow set. And it's going to be sort of like a built-in set. Uh, right. Uh, implement support for substituting uh, substituting st substituting this part correct. I hope it's part of correct. Anyway, uh, so let's try to rebuild uh, the compiler. And what do we have in here? So state. Uh, yeah. So the problem here. Can I just like do something like this, please? All right. Uh, okay, so it says that four is not covered. Okay, so that's perfect actually. So when I have a statement four, uh, this is very interesting. So I have a uh, essentially var and set. Uh, so that's the substitution I do in here, and then I have a body. So the question is, should the substitution actually allow us to substitute things like var or set or anything like that? This is very interesting idea. What if you can have a set of sets? For example, I can define bits and parent, and then I can say all, which is parent bits. Right, and then I can do iteration for um, set in all, right, and then for p in set. So if I allow this kind of substitution, so essentially, this is a very interesting idea, honestly. So that will just automatically work if I allow this kind of stuff. So and the bits obviously have to be something like, like this. Is it really useful for anything? So it's sort of like a meta level. Huh. So and it works uh, like a purely on a symbolic level. I can put it in. Uh, yes, yeah, self revision structure. Uh, here we go with the Rust pane. It's not really that difficult. So self referential structures are not that difficult because you can use boxes, right? So there, there's the hacks to, to make it less painful. Um, I already have a self referential things. So for example, four. Uh, yeah, there we go. So four, it's a body with inside of the box in a statement. So as you can see, this statement is defined within like itself. So it's totally fine. So it's totally fine. Um, we can try to get rid of the box. Uh, I want to experiment with that. Mm -hmm. Anyways, a substitute, substitute, uh, offend, substitute. So let's actually try to do that. Um, yeah. 
replacing var doesn't really make sense, but replacing set does make sense, I think. Um, so set, and set is just a name, right? So it's simply a name, uh, nothing particularly special. Uh, okay, so, and then what I have to do, uh -huh. I can do body, body, uh, substitute, substitute, uh, var set. So it's sort of like a recursive thing, but it creates a new one, which I also have to put in the box. All right, so it's gonna be like that. And, if I, and then I have to do statement for uh, var set body. Oh yeah, there we go. So I don't have to put semicolon in here, by the way. So that's basically everything. That's basically everything. Let's try to compile this, at least. Uh, all right, so what do we have in here? So this has to be curly braces. All right, so what do we have in here? So what you didn't like. What you didn't like. What you didn't like. I don't understand. So self data moved. Ah, mother flipper. Ah, I see. Mm, I mean, oh my. Okay, so can I just dereference it like that then? So are you fine already? Uh -huh. So, and with the var, all right, so let me let me try to do the following thing. I'm going to do freaking references. Freaking Rust, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I, I don't even know what to think about this language. I've been programming this language in, since 2016, and it's just like, uh, it's such an annoying language. Like, I still didn't grow to like it, honestly. Mm -mm. I still didn't grow to like it. Uh, so, uh, consistently annoying, yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me see. Unknown set set. All right, so that that's a completely wrong thing in here. Okay. Wait, it just fucking worked with all this shit. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Do you guys remember this uh, like a uh, YouTube video with a, with a parrot? <laughs> Go to YouTube and, and Google up like a parrot a WTF. It's such a funny video, like, like I remember it every time I'm trying to say what the fuck, just like, it's like a parrot just saying, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the uh, Anyway, so that, it's, it's a cool video, I really like it. Uh, so let me take a look at the uh, this thing. So it, it is actually balanced. It is actually, in fact, balanced. So we can try to now maybe test it like that and it should say it, it's unbalanced. So it works, what the fuck? So that means I can do things like this in Paren and just do it like that, uh, like this, pick. Uh, and that should also work. That works. Uh, what is tape? It's a uh, it's a file with data, right? Oh shit! It doesn't work. Fuck. So it broke. Uh, all right. So that's bizarre. P and Parin uh, didn't work properly. Ah. Wait. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So this is incorrect. Because yeah, because it switches to different states. It switches to different states, so that's that's because yeah. So to make it work properly, we'll have to implement like actual statements. We'll have to implement actual statements. To be fair, we can compress these kind of things, right? So let's actually go ahead and just compress these kind of things. Uh, case, um, yeah, I can just do it like that. Uh, and this is going to be p uh, p. And there we go. So we compress this thing, which is pretty cool. Uh, can we compress anything else? I, I suppose we can compress this thing as well. Um, right. So reset parents. Um, so let me copy paste it for p in parent, uh, and this is just going to be that. So that allows us to compress this entire thing. Um, we can also introduce the set of bits. So, yeah, 
we should introduce a set of bits bits uh, 0 1 right so that's basically two sets that we have in here and it allows us to do these kind of things so uh, for b in bits we're going to b b and we compress that so look at that this is actually kind of cool so we have a state reset bits and b is bits in here and then when you encounter a delimiter you switch to reset parents and reset parents is parents you right and like it's kind of symmetrical in here i kind of like it uh so this one is not particularly compressible um this one is maybe compressible but not really um so to compress things even further i think we need to introduce like s expressions in here right so we need to introduce s expressions but so far this one seems to be working so far this one seems to be working so let me try to test that and it says it's unbalanced which it is uh, right so let me remove that thing to make it balanced and hopefully it will say it is balanced okay so that's pretty cool so we introduced for loops right so on today's stream we managed to introduce like actual for loops there's still quite a few things that we need to implement right so specifically uh, we need to implement, uh, I suppose, blocks, right? So we need to be able to implement this kind of thing, uh, like so. Because maybe you want to be able to have several cases in here, right? So it will implement them in bulk. So that's one of the things we're definitely going to have in here. Um, so another thing we need to have is the S expressions instead of the symbols, right? So uh, because one of the way I want to um you know compress this thing is i want to implement something like this for p in parents if you are in a peak state and you read a parent right you read the parent you replace that parent with a placeholder and you switch to uh like something like update but with p right so essentially i want to replace ink and deck with expression update that holds either open parent or close parent and depending on which one it holds it actually either increments that number or decrements uh, that number and that way i can actually compress this thing into a single sort of like a statement uh, like so right for p and parent and that just generates everything so yeah uh, but for now it is not really possible because we don't have expressions like that so we'll need to implement exp expressions first uh, so this is one of the things we'll have to do but even without it we managed to compress that quite a bit so and the language became a little bit more powerful uh, the language became a little bit more powerful so let me actually commit whatever we have in here uh, so why it's hanging I'm not sure sure why it is hanging so rule 110 uh, I'm not going to commit it yet because it's not really implemented properly but so here is that here is that uh huh mm, so yeah uh, let's say implement uh, sets and for loops so this is what we managed to implement on today's stream uh, yep so that's pretty cool so i suppose we're going to implement uh, s expressions on the next stream right so and compress this entire example even further uh, and eventually we're going to achieve the epic victory royale so sounds good sounds good Chi. Um, right i guess that's it for today thanks everyone who's watching me right now i really appreciate that have a good one and i see you all on the next recreation programming session with amista azuzin i love you Mwah.